This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, William Mangan, professor of anthropology at Syracuse University, speaks on the dynamics of Latin American urbanization. This is the sixth of seven special broadcasts of speakers at Iowa State University's World Affairs Institute on Latin America. <music> Professor Mangan. So, I think I'll talk a while about what I was going to talk about and then show some pictures and talk during the pictures and and have some questions. Like sometimes it's easier to find out what's on people's minds if you stop, although I've got that built-in 50-minute clock. I'll try to not do that. And when I start talking, I usually don't stop for about 50 minutes. But as Elliot said, that's all over this year anyway. So <laughs> I might as well enjoy it while I can. The, I've, I've written some things about squatter settlements. And, and I think I have. I've had some influence on housing policy. I'm not terribly pleased about that. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, but John Turner, another man who's worked with me and we've worked on the same kinds of things apart for a number of years, I, I think we, we, could, we can really say that at least in Peru we've had some influence on, on policy and, and housing. And because of that, we've been criticized a lot. And I'd like to try to at least handle some of those criticisms because sometimes if I present my view of a particular aspect of urbanization, and you haven't heard anybody else's, which is generally the case because everybody isn't studying every problem, it sounds sort of convincing because I don't present the other view. And there are a number of other views of what's happening other than, than the one that I, I take. And also the one I take can be misinterpreted. So I'll try to show why I think that's happened on a couple of occasions. The title, Dynamics of Urbanization in Latin America, is, I think, a little too broad for what I want to do. I, I could, I suppose, talk about you know, the enormity of the population problem and all that. I don't mean to, you know, to minimize that. But I want to talk about one aspect of urbanization, which is migration to cities, and one aspect of that, really, which is the creation of squatter settlements around large cities. And I, what I say doesn't apply to Argentina or Uruguay or Cuba, which are countries that aren't as underdeveloped as the countries I'm going to talk about, not as rapidly urbanizing. I they are still urbanizing, but not at the rate of the countries I'm going to talk about. And I also don't, they don't apply to Paraguay or to Honduras or some countries that aren't urbanizing as fast. They, but mainly the, they'll apply to Peru, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela, countries that have large cities and a very, very high rate of urbanization. And that's where the kinds of squatter settlements that that I want to show some pictures of and talk about are, are found. The, I have an article here by Barbara Ward that I've been trying to read for quite some time. I, I Xeroxed it, figuring that now I, I wouldn't, you know, I'd have it and I'd read it. I've had it about a year. It was written December 6, 1969. And I finally did look at some of it this afternoon. But the, the main reason I brought it now, because I have read the first page about five or six times as I started to, to read it. And her, her view, you know, Barbara Ward is an economist who has written a lot of things about you know, economics in Europe and sort of in the third world. And this article appeared in The Economist last year, and it's called The Poor World Cities. And I want to read about three paragraphs in that article because this presents a view that I think is, is a real view. This is not something that I would object to, but it's something that I suppose my view is, is slightly different from. So I want to read hers, and hers is a much more classical view of of what squatter settlements are. And it's not just Latin America that has them. This is from Barbara Ward's article. Drive from the neo-functional glass and concrete of any big city airport in the developing world to the neo-functional glass and concrete of the latest big city hotel, and somewhere in between, you're bound to pass one or other of the sectors in which half and more of the city dwellers are condemned to live. Sometimes the modern highway passes above them. Looking down, the traveler catches a glimpse under a pall of smoke from cooking pots and backyards of mile on mile of little alleys snaking through densely packed huts of straw, crumbling brick or beaten tin cans. Or the settlements are above the route, clinging to hillsides, reached only by endless little stairways carved from the mud down which the waters rush in the rainy season, scouring away rubbish and dirt, and pouring as often as not through the shacks themselves. 
or the main road slices through some pre-existent shanty town, and for a brief span the visitor looks down the endless length of rows of huts, sees the holes, the mud, the rubbish, and the alleyways, skinny chickens picking in the dirt, multitudes of nearly naked children, hair matted, eyes dull, spindly legs, and above them pathetic lines of rags and torn garments strung up to dry between the stunted trees. And these, as likely as not, are hardly the worst places. The worst are hidden away nearer the city center, dense, filthy tenements in the old town, a first staging post for rural migrants. Here the buildings are high, dirt accumulates on every floor, the staircase wells and lift shafts serve as latrines. Every room is infested, rats roam the yards, bugs fall from the broken ceilings. The sour smell of bitter poverty per pervades every room and hallway. In winter, piercing cold gathers in the dark buildings. Summer allows no respite from the breathless, festering heat. There are many names around the world for these shanty towns and slums. Colonias proletarias in Mexico, Gurbivils in Tunis, Bustis in India, Barriadas in Peru, Chesecando in Turkey, Ranchos in Venezuela. But they all describe the same thing, the places in which, quite probably, human misery and discomfort reach their most devastating pitch. And I don't say that isn't the case. And probably some of you have had that experience of driving through or by shanty towns, squatter settlements. But I think that there's a lot more to it than that. And I think there, there's another side to shanty towns. That, but I, I'm not all that optimistic about it. Like sometimes when I present the other side, people say, oh, that, you know, isn't that nice that everything is as good as he says? And I'm very pessimistic, really, about the future of, of a lot of cities in the world, including a lot in the United States. But within that kind of a pessimistic trajectory, I think the squatter settlements represent a, a positive solution. The people have done something, have taken the initiative, and have, have created cities for themselves under terrible conditions, and done it much better than any government could possibly have done it. No government has done anything like what people have done for themselves in, in squatter settlements. So I'm not saying it's the best possible solution if you had the choice of any solution, but it's, it's a solution that you know, isn't as bad as Barbara Ward would paint it. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is because squatter settlements transform so fast that what you see very often is, is a, a place that's just gone up, that, that is built of makeshift materials, and that does have that look of sort of temporary, very picturesque. People take pictures of them all the time because the houses of poor people might not be very nice to live in, but they're great to take pictures of. So you see a lot of pictures of these places hanging over roads and all that. But what people do is, is convert them as fast as they can with a little equity they get by giving up paying rents in cities and seizing a piece of land. But I'll, I'll come to that in a second. I want to say a few things about the whole well, peasant migration that's going on all over the world and that has been going on in the history of man. That, that's what happens. That you know, If you took a kind of a schematic diagram of the history of man on Earth. I suppose man would be a hunter and gatherer for like that long, and then agriculture would come in, and industrialization would be maybe that much of the, you know, of the whole time of man on Earth. But since that beginnings of agriculture and the beginnings of the kind of rural-urban you know, split and peasantries existing, coexisting with cities, peasants have been coming to cities. So it's not a, a new thing. It's as old as, as the word peasant, whatever that means, that category. Is, has been associated with cities. And a lot of these people who've come to cities have done very well. Most of the people, probably a lot of people in this room, including myself, uh, grandparents or great-grandparents were peasants someplace. And you know, my four grandparents came from, came from Ireland, and I suppose they were, at least three of them were, were farm people. So I suppose they're, they're peasants. And when they came to this country, they, you know, one of them was a coal miner, one of them was a policeman, all those kind of stereotype things that people do in different ethnic groups. And, and somehow it seems like less foreign, if you think of it that way. That the, a, lot of, a lot of peasants have come to cities and done more or less well or non-well. But I, I think the first thing I want to say is that, that peasants coming to cities is not a particularly new thing. And cities growing through accretion on the outskirts of people building their own communities is not particularly new. The, since the Second World War, it's become very dramatic because the, the numbers have gone up so fast. But I think Lima, where I've done most of my own work, the, the city has always grown through people moving on to the outside and building some houses and making up some kind of title to them, and the title gets more or less recognized. And that's all pretty arbitrary anyway. I have a little piece of a poem <coughs> by Carl Sandburg. It's from the people, yes. It's a few lines from that poem. So get off this estate. And what for? Because it's mine. Where'd you get it? From my father. Where'd he get it? From his father. And where'd he get it? He fought for it. Well, I'll fight you for it. And I think essentially that's sort of the way country, countries get populated and titles get written if you have the power to, to write a title and get somebody to back it up. So it, 
to all this business of squatters seizing land, this suddenly, is that, as if that's strange, it's really not that strange. It's not that different from the way a lot of people acquire the land that they're on. And also some of the titles that they have that they handwrite, the very fancy, <clears throat> one thing you learn in Peruvian schools is how to write beautifully. And so people write titles out and they put seals on them and wax seals and stamps on the back. And you kind of laugh and say, well, isn't that a funny title that that person has? But then you look at the title that somebody with a lot of money has to a house out in Chosica, and it turns out it looks a lot like that. And maybe it came out pretty much the same way. So the title problem, it's, although it's a real problem to the people in squatter settlements, their, their titles aren't that strange. The second thing I'd like to say is kind of a preamble, is that I take the view that poverty is much more apt to be a situation that's built into a social structure rather than you know, a kind of dependency based on personal inadequacy. And there's been a lot of discussion of that over many years. And I suppose that two of the most important people in anthropology, at least writing about it recently, are George Foster and Oscar Lewis. George Foster, who's developed an idea of the image of limited good, which I think is a sort of useful idea that in a lot of peasant communities all over the world, people see the world as <clears throat> sort of finite in terms of resources. There's a finite amount of goodness, finite amount of health, finite amount of wealth, land. So if anybody gets a little more than anybody else, it's always at the expense of somebody else. And if you have that view, it sort of inhibits change. And the other, and much more well-known than Foster's, is Oscar Lewis's Culture of Poverty, which almost everybody has heard some reference to, although a surprising number of people who use the phrase haven't read what Lewis has said about it. But, but anyway, that, that idea has some of those same characteristics. That somehow it's your own fault if you're poor because you've got a bad culture, you've got bad customs. And I think generally that's not the case. You can see, I think, all kinds of evidence that people can change that culture, so, which means it really isn't a culture, if they get access to some resources, that, more money, something like that. And Illich, like a lot of things he says, would also fit into that interpretation, really, that people, it's not through personal inadequacy, that it's through a kind of a built-in bias in the social structure. There's also another bias that's very strong in social science maybe a little less so in anthropology, although anthropology has it toward primitives in much the same way, a sort of anti-city. Sociologists in the United States have been generally, up until fairly recently, anti-city. That somehow the model of goodness is a small town or small farm community, and evil is the big city, especially as personified by Chicago, because a lot of early sociologists in the United States were Middle Western people from small towns who thought Chicago was sort of the center of you know, sin and evil. And so that was kind of written into the social disorganization and family and city literature of sociology. And it fits into a kind of a general Western European view that cities are bad places. That somehow it's better to be poor or rich out in the country than it is in the city. And I think sometimes that accounts for the, all these kind of horror story things you get in these books about Latin America, 11th hour, or you know, Asia, revolution or revolution, all, the, all those kinds of scare books that people write and seem to, you know, every year they get published and they sell and they're usually sort of interesting. They tell you the 10 things that are wrong that turn out to be the same 10 things that are wrong with every place. And, and they're really there. But I think they're a little bit alarmist and somehow you get the impression in them, if only people would stop coming to cities. Why don't they stay out in the country? Or why don't they go to the jungle in Peru? They're trying to get the Indians to go off to the jungle. If only they, you know, they'd stop coming to cities, everything would be all right. But people don't do that. And before I show the pictures and talk about how the squatter settlements in Peru were, were formed, I'd like to just go through a series of what I think are very commonly held myths about who is in squatter settlements. And I built these up mainly about Peru, but I've been surprised over the last, oh, since about 64, when I have seen some other countries. Up until that time, I'd pretty much spent my time going to Peru and coming back to the United States and maybe stopping for a few days somewhere in between. But since 64, I've had an opportunity to spend about a week in a favela in Rio and about three days in looking at squatter settlements in Colombia, about two weeks in Guayaquil. These are not exactly long field trips, but, but when, you've, you know, when you've seen one squatter settlement, you've seen them all. I wouldn't say that. Uh, but the, no, but I, you know, it, it's, um, at least I, I've had some look at, at squatter settlements now in other places. And, and they do seem, a lot of things seem to apply to other places as well as to Lima. And the, one of the first ones that in Peru has a particular slant to it, but in other countries has something comparable, is that the squatter settlements are formed by people from rural areas. Well, that turns out to be true overwhelmingly in the censuses that have been taken. But
But the, the myth is that these people have come directly from rural areas to squatter settlements. And it's very hard to break that down in Peru, in spite of the fact that all kinds of information has been published by, not just by, by me now, I was at one foreigner doing it, but lots of Peruvians have, have pointed out through the census done by Manny Jose Matos and various other studies that the Barriada residents, although they're born in rural areas, are people who've been in the city anywhere from five to 10 to 20 years. The average time in the city, in one place that we worked in, 57 to 59, was just under 10 years for the head of family which meant, and there was nobody there who'd been there less than a year. So these are urban phenomena, even though they're rural people who are coming to the squatter settlements, they're rural people who've spent considerable time in the city before going. Now one of the reasons, and in Peru, that to, there's an extra little thing in Peru about them, that they're supposed to be full of Indians. Because I think to a lot of people in Lima, there's a kind of a funny ambivalence of a, some kind of romantic idea of how the Incas were, and then somehow there's a big block in there that the Incas had nothing to do with the Indians who are around today. They're brutes. The one word, Indio Bruto, is the kind of expression for Indian in, in much of Peru. And so some of them have no connection with the romantic Incas. And, and if you look up on a hillside in some of the barriadas of Lima, and I've got some pictures. I don't know if I brought any today that would show this. I think I did maybe one at least. But if you look at a hillside, a barriada like El Agostino or something like that, then maybe you'll see 50 people. And out of those 50 people, 45 of them will have on the kind of clothes that you, know, that you see, khaki shirts, khaki pants, suits, Western clothes. But the thing that would stand out going by would be maybe the five Indian women with pigtails and long skirts and colorful shawls. And, and so somehow you get the impression that must be you know, a lot of Indians up there. And in fact, it's you know, most of the people. We did run into some older women in some of the barriadas who didn't speak Spanish. And in one case, some people who hadn't even been to the center of Lima, and you could see this, the skyline about 15 minutes away by bus, and they'd, they'd never been there. But, but that's an exception, and it's mostly older people who maybe were brought down to live with their, you know, their married children, something like that. Most of the people are fairly sophisticated about urban things and have lived in the city ahead of time. So the idea that the rural people is right, but the idea that they suddenly appeared on the scene, not only is wrong, but if you think about it for five minutes, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous, because how could they have possibly have done that? How could people who didn't know each other and who've come in from all over the country suddenly organize themselves and, and appear on, on these hillsides. So, but that's a myth that's very hard to break down. That, that's a very commonly held one. A second one is that they're disorganized. And you see that word used all the time. And, and again, it seems to me it's one of the most highly organized sectors of the population of Peru and Venezuela and, and Colombia and Chile as well. I can't imagine the government of any of those countries, and Brazil thrown in particularly maybe even, who could have organized that kind of a popular housing operation, where a third of the city, in the case of all those cities, of Rio and Caracas and Bogota, maybe Bogota a little less, Lima and Santiago, about a third of the city is in squatter settlement, which is millions of people. And the idea that a government could have possibly organized that is just inconceivable to me. It's, so the disorganization is not only a myth, it's like a direct opposite of, of what the situation is. And the way the squatter settlements are formed, generally, now it's changed a little bit because the governments, particularly in Chile and, and Peru, have relaxed a lot on figuring, well, you know, we'll, maybe we'll try to channel where they go and provide some services, but won't try to stop them anymore. But up until, you know, at least till 64, and to a certain extent even after that, the governments tried to stop the invasions. So what happens is a group of people will decide they want to move out of the city and they'll pick a place that they want to go to. And they know if they go alone, or if 10 of them go, the police will put them off. So they have to get a fairly good sized group to, to invade. I'm not sure what the optimum is. I remember having talked to a lot of people about that who were actually planning invasions, because it's a concern of theirs, because if you get too many, you know, it gets out of hand. And if you get too many people you don't know, somebody will tell the police. So you have to recruit among people you know and you have to recruit in such a way that you know, you know you're getting somebody who's serious about it, and yet you can't, you can't just keep it up forever because the longer the time you organize, the more the chance of you know, having someone tell. So maybe in the course of anywhere from a month to three months to four or five at times, people will try to form the group that's going to do the invading. And it's become a kind of a ritual now. People know just what to do. And I wrote a little description of what a lot of people had done because when I was first studying this, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people who had organized invasions and who were in invasions. And so I wrote a thing that combining a lot of things people had done. And I've seen that 
as recently as 64, I've seen copies or versions of that mimeographed around because people kind of used parts of that as a checklist as to what to do because it's a, uh, but that it wasn't because I made them up. None of the things were there that I made up. There were things that people had done. But what people will now very likely do is find a law student who will help them out, who will go find out what the title situation is on the piece of land they want to invade. And if it's public land, it's easier. If it's church land, it's fairly easy, depending on what church it is. If it's private, it's harder. If it's land in litigation, it's easier, because it's not sure which owner is supposed to respond. So it's, the people are very shrewd about that, picking a place. Then when they, when they go there, they can't afford to fight about where to go, because it has to be done fairly fast. So they kind of lay the place out. But if they lay it out visibly, somebody will see it. So you can't just make big white marks or something. I have to put little piles of stones and kind of draw plans. And <clears throat> then you have to get everybody to appear at one place at one time. And they come from all over the city. And they come in rented cars, you know, taxis, trucks that they borrow or that they pay someone for the use of. They get to a place with the material to build a house, which means enough mat walls to put up a house. And usually, and some people have to bring their stuff with them, stoves. And, and they bring pictures of Jesus and pictures of the Virgin Mary and flags and things like that, because those are good things to put up all over the place when the police come. And then they call somebody, like maybe a president's wife or someone with some influence in society, try to get them to be the patron or the patrona of the, the barrio. They call the radio, newspaper, now the television figuring the police will be less <coughs> violent if there's somebody there to watch. And these things are all sort of, now they, people know about it. And so it's, it goes, they go through a kind of ritual. In many of the, the Barriada invasions in the 50s, people were killed in the first attack by the police on them and beaten and a lot of their property lost, the houses burned and all that, the straw places burned. And in, in almost every one of them, somebody's been, people have been beaten, by, say, and a lot of them people were killed. And then they, they come back again. And about the third time they come back, the government stops. And I think that has something to do with a lack of control. One of the reasons why this solution to problems won't work in the United States is because there's such control here and such a you know, highly organized political system and such a different proportion. We have maybe 20 to 30 percent of the population poor. And in Peru, it's in Brazil, it'll be 80 to 90 percent poor. So it's a very different kind of proportion. So it's very hard to, to pull off something like that. In New York City, in some of the invasions of tenement houses now, that, or apartment houses that are being torn down, people have squatted on them. And I think it's somewhat similar, because the government of the city isn't really prepared to throw them out violently. And that's the same with the national government of Peru and, and Brazil. They just can't, they aren't strong enough, or as Herman Kahn would say, they don't have the will, which is a good thing for everybody they don't, to really ride down that many people. So they allow people to stay. And people put up straw in places, and then vote for office. They have elected officials, a number of different uh, officials who are elected each year. And I say fairly highly organized. The organization begins to break down a little bit as the attack from outside lets up. But, but it's fairly ho highly organized at first. Another common myth is that barriadas represent an economic drag on the country. Somehow if these places were only not there, everybody would be happier, that they're costing the country. In fact, you can make just the opposite case that they're not costing the country, that there's a tremendous investment in infrastructure. People build stairways and roads. They set up all kinds of private businesses by right? selling electricity to each other. People truck in water and sell the water. A tremendous amount of recycling industry. People use junk products, the waste products of industry to, to build the houses themselves, to build furniture, tires to make shoes, to make bed frames, and all kinds of you know, a business is going on. People sell things in their front rooms. People resell vegetables and fruits, start all kinds of you know, food markets. And so they're, they're anything but an economic drag in a way. And also in terms of employment, because the selection factor in getting in is governed by kind of an organized group, it's practically only young married people with young kids who get into barriadas. Now, husbands desert very much the way they do in the general population. But they start out with a high percentage, almost 100% complete families, and usually people with jobs, because you have to have some resources to be able to get back and forth to a job, because the barriadas are generally outside of cities enough, or far enough away, so you have to pay bus fares to, to get in and out. So it's a slightly higher economic population than the population of city slums. And let's see, the two others, I want to start showing the pictures to see if the time is going faster than I thought, is 
crime, vice, all that sort of business supposed to be going on in Barrio. And it's very unsafe. I'm sure some of you have been in South American cities, friends and tourist guides and various, oh, you can't go into the favela, you can't go into Barrio. And if you've done it, you find that's not true, that they're not particularly dangerous places. You might get bitten by a dog or something like that. But they, as far as being assaulted, you're much more likely to be assaulted on the waterfront, say, of a city or some, yeah, it's very, well, anyway, I think most Latin American cities are considerably safer than North American cities anyway. But the, the fact is that they're not particularly dangerous places, certainly not centers of any you know, widespread amounts of vice or crime because people don't have that kind of money and it's not, a very, it's not that kind of place you get much of that. Some of the ones around markets, maybe it'll be some prostitutes, something like that. And the last one, and probably the most common myth, and the one that's the hardest to dispel, and in a way I wish it weren't a myth, is that the barriales are sources of political radicalism. And, and that's been a big disappointment to a lot of students and to a lot of Peace Corps volunteers in some ways. And, and I say, if I had my own way, I, in a way I wish people were a little more radical. But in fact, what's happened, except for a few barriales in Bogota and in Santiago, is that the, the vast majority of people seem to be, and the few studies that have been done by some by a fellow named Goldrich, from, used to be from Oregon, now works at the Ford Foundation, of voting behavior, and from a lot of observations of, of what people say about what they want, once people take the revolutionary step of seizing a piece of land, which is a you know, very revolutionary step, they are very apt to become sort of conservative property owners. And you find a lot of people in Barriales who voted for Odria in the elections in Peru, and who, who are sort of law and order people in, in a sense, because they, they feel like they've got a, a big stake in the society, because they've you know, sort of gotten a, a house that's worth something. And the importance of a house to a poor person with, not, with unsteady employment just can't be overrated because if you have a house you're not paying rent on, if you lose your job you don't lose the house, it's, it's vastly superior to any kind of housing project that AID has ever been able to build because they can't compete in price and you don't have to make that monthly payment. And in fact, in some cases, I think I mentioned this in another class the other day, in Brazil when a, one of these Alliance for Progress cities was built, they had to take people out of a favela in police wagons, handcuff them to get them to go out of the favela into the housing project. And when they got to the housing project, it was too far, the bus fares were too high, and the building was badly built, a lot of graft involved in the building of the, and so they, they leaked and the doors didn't close. And the favela had been very convenient, and real estate that was worth something, and people had been thrown off. Let me show the pictures then, and then I'll take some questions. During the question period following the showing of some slides, a listener asked what would happen if they had housing codes. What would happen if they had housing codes? <laughs> I can't answer that. It would depend on what they were like, you know. They, housing codes are pretty arbitrary things anyway, I suppose. One of the reasons you have housing codes is so you can have people working in the housing code office. And you know, I, I don't know. I suppose they'd have people working in the housing code office if they had housing codes. Housing codes? Yeah. Nobody pays attention to housing codes in this country, do they? I got stopped a lot. <laughs> from, from invading a piece of public land? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a different situation. The zoning is not a, a particularly widespread custom in the world. And zoning hasn't really taken on in any Latin American city that I know of. There, there are plans. People make city plans on the basis of zoning. But the whole idea is not, not very strong. And since it's illegal to be there anyway, how could you enforce the housing code? Yeah. 
A Brazilian student asked Professor Mangan if he knew anything more recent about the housing projects of the Alliance for Progress days in the early 60s in Brazil. I don't. No, I, I, it's, I think the, the super blocks in Caracas, which were a financial disaster at the beginning and still, I mean, in terms of cost, are, are being used now. And some of the housing projects in Bogota that seem to be way overpriced, they just raised the level of the people who came into them. And I, I expect that probably in Brazil, that's what's, that's what's happened to a lot of the AID housing projects, that they've just, instead of having the population they thought would be in them, they've, they've put a higher rent people in. Yeah. Another person mentioned a fairly successful housing project in which a thousand units a day are being built. A thousand units a day are being built. Well, I, again, I don't, maybe I think, I, I'm glad in a way that you, you said that because I, I tend to be sort of flippant about housing projects. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't build them, but I think in terms of the economics of that kind of housing, it's very hard to see how it can compete with squatter housing because favelas are still being built too. And there's, there's, a big, there's a big need for low income housing of that kind. And I think when, it, when it's built for a population that can afford it, there's obviously no reason not to build it. But it seemed to me, of course, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe somehow Brazil has solved that. But in Peru and Colombia, and in Sao Paulo, as of a few years ago, I, I was talking with some people in a conference in Chile who were working in housing in Brazil, that it's very hard to compete with squatter housing for people who are who are at a different, who are lower economic level from the kind of people who can afford public housing. Now maybe a, a thousand units a day, I don't know, Neil Mitchell at the Harvard School of Architecture has tried to bid on contracts with the International Development Bank and for various kinds of national co you know, competitions for plans for houses. And he makes a lot of money on other kinds of work and he does that almost as a sideline because he's interested in low cost housing. And the thing that always gets in the way of competing with squatter housing is that you have to pay for the land, you have to pay for the urbanization, you have to pay for the services. And once those three costs are sort of put into a price, it makes it so expensive that a lot of people just can't afford it and they're going to keep on building squatter housing. But I'm not saying because of that that somehow government shouldn't build public housing. And I suppose that, that was the tone that I was taking. Somehow that it's bad to build housing. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't say that. I think, but I don't think any government could keep up with the demand for housing. A thousand units a day is a lot. I, I had no idea that that was happening. Did you encounter any feeling of, why don't you stop studying this and start helping us? Not much, you know. In a way, I felt sometimes that way. Maybe it's, and people ask, and people use you too. It's not that you don't help, because sometimes being a foreigner and having some kinds of contacts, people like the Peace Corps volunteers in particular were used as go-betweens with ministries and as you know, sort of entree people into government offices to get some kinds of help that were available. But I, I never ran into much of that. I, I think that, that's sort of a, I don't know, I, maybe, I, I don't know, that's a, it's a big complicated topic, but I, I get the impression, even with a lot of North American Indians, that oh, they're, they're fed up with people showing up. People are very polite. And that Vine Deloria sort of wishes that there was more of that feeling. And maybe he's right that there should be. But I, I find people are remarkably polite about investigators coming in. I, I don't do much questionnaire work, and I, I know when I lived in, in that barriado off and on during a, a two-year period, I, you know, I, I tried to at least be a, a kind of a, an occasional neighbor and, and live there and not be someone who was always taking out in terms of data and, and photographs. And I could see how in, in some places people are getting, particularly in the United States, that that whole idea is coming out of use. People are always asking us questions and never getting anything back. But I never ran into much of that at all. In fact, I, I was surprised in two years ago in, in Guayaquil that people who were right in a spot, they were about to be thrown off and they were very suspicious. They were just so nice and so polite that they, they people asked me in and told me all about what was going on there. And I, I could see it. If I had been living there, I would have probably said, get out of here, I don't have time for that. But I haven't run into much of that. What kind of relationship exists between the Peace Corps and aid? Well, I don't know now. I know when, earlier, when, during Kennedy's day, there was a kind of a rivalry between the two that I think was you know, a little bit artificial, where Peace Corps is always saying, oh, these AID technicians, and, you know, they're, they're doing all these bad things. Now I think Peace Corps is becoming a kind of a cheap AID. But that, that's the intent of the Peace Corps now, is to sort of phase out AID and make the Peace Corps a little more expensive and make that a kind of technical assistance, you know, change the whole character of the Peace Corps. But 
The relationship was always pretty bad, I thought. And a lot of competition, a lot of backbiting, and you know, we're doing all the good things and you're doing all the bad things. I think in some ways, the, although again, I, I don't know what, maybe that some of those projects are now, you know, the housing projects are now working. In Peru, uh, particularly in housing, the AID impact was very costly and almost worthless in terms of meeting the market they were trying to meet, where Peace Corps at least didn't get into development projects much. Someone else asked this question. Would it be feasible to take the money that formerly went into aid housing projects and lend it out to entrepreneurs in Barriadas? You know, I, again, the, the question was, would, would it be feasible to take the money that formerly went into AID housing projects and lend it out to entrepreneurs in Barriadas? Well, I don't know. You know I, my, my version of all these things is very distorted because I, I have kind of an emotional bias against planners. And, and so I feel very presumptuous make giving advice to anybody anyway because in a lot of cases, you know, I, I really don't know. And I think John Turner, who's an architect that I've worked with, has some of these same problems that he gets these kind of romantic ideas that you know, people know what they want better than planners know what they want. And, and, and sometimes when you do that, you really, I think, appear to someone who's trying very hard to figure out a way to make a reasonable plan for a big city. You appear like some kind of a fool, somebody who's you know, suddenly appeared on the scene from North America who was saying, well, gee, what are you doing all this for? And so I, I don't know that I have a, an answer for that. I think, apart from the housing, which even in the United States, it's very hard to, you know, for the government to be in the housing business, that loans directly to small businesses in Barriadas and Favelas it would be a, a very useful thing in terms of sort of political propaganda value. It would be great if that's what people are worried about, as they sometimes are. In terms of local development, it's needed very badly. Interest rates are terribly high on loans, 40% to borrow money. So if there, if there was some way to to give loans to businesses that have already been established, transportation businesses, water, electric businesses, it would be a good idea, I would think. But it gets in the way of the master plan of the city. Because, well, we don't want them there anyway. Why do you want to lend them money for businesses? We want them to get them out of there and put in a hydraulic project and drain that area and put up an airport, you know, that sort of thing. And you know, you can't stop that. I, I don't think that it's my business to say, put the airport somewhere else. So I don't really know the answer. But I think probably it's not going to be an issue because AID stopped doing all that stuff anyway. And I think it's good that, that they have. And finally, this question. What are some of the factors that go into the planned invasions? Do people simply transplant city and rural patterns? I, that, that varies. I think, again, I know more about Peru than other places. And I think in some cases where people have invaded private land, they don't consolidate the construction because they're, they're not sure they're going to stay there. But in, in Chile, where the government has practically told people where to, to invade, and in Brazil, and I mean in, in Peru, where they're now sort of tacitly saying, "All right, it's, it's all right that you're there." The the pattern is pretty much the the general Latin American urban pattern: the square streets, setting, leaving plazas, and and a lot of the inside of the house, very much like a lot of the inside of urban houses in Lima, is based on a kind of rural patio backyard pattern. So that the the patterns that are brought in are are not new patterns; they're the, the patterns of, sort of small town housing. And, and one of the problems with that, when you try to put in a, a rural rancho in an urban setting wall to wall, uh, the ventilation is not as good as it could be. And there, there are a lot of things that a, an architect or a, you know, a planner, an engineer could do to make that housing better. And it's too bad that there hasn't been more uh, assistance to people in building their own houses, I think, because they probably would have gotten better houses out of it. And some of the projects that have been tried in Lima where the government has actually given people that option, in one in a place called Huascaran, People were given money, sort of the way Yelich talks about education. They were given money, loan money, and they could either take technical assistance from the Junta de la Vivienda or not, and most of them did. And, but then they studied the project very thoroughly, and John Turner wrote a little report on it. People were able to buy materials cheaper, house by house, and in a few cases they put common walls in, in some of the houses, but mostly building their own houses, get the stuff cheaper than the housing authority could buy it in bulk because they had no storage problem, no transportation problem. They just had to go buy it at the moment they wanted it and transport it back in a, say, a taxi or a, or a truck. They were able to get services cheaper because if they wanted a plumber, they'd hire him and bring him right there and hand him the tools and, and just pay him for the time he worked. And 
and they were quite interested in any suggestions that the architects had about getting more light, more air into the house. And it's an interesting little place. It's right across the Puente del Ejército in Lima. And it's, I, I think, one of the most successful projects of the, of the Junta. And there have been several. I'm not trying, again, I, I suppose my tone is that housing authorities are full of people who don't know what they're doing. It's just not true. There are a lot of very good people. And, but obviously, they have to make political decisions and satisfy a lot of constituencies other than just the squatter settlement constituency. So, you know, so a lot of times, uh, what, what happens is what happened in Belo Unde, finally, in a big burst of architectural glory, put practically the whole energy of, of the, the best architects in Peru into building an upper-class housing project on an old racetrack. And it's very nice. And, and it met a big need, a tremendous need. They filled it up. So I'm not saying they shouldn't have done that. So people can't always be worrying about, you know, about one sector or another. But what happens in the meantime is people just create the kind of houses they know how to build. And some of them are they are way overbuilt in the bottom. They build fantastic foundations. They put enough cement to hold 20-story buildings sometimes because it looks very solid. And you know, people like that idea of having a very solid construction. OK, thank you. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, William Mangan, professor of anthropology at the University of Syracuse, spoke on the dynamics of Latin American urbanization. This has been the sixth in a series of seven special lectures from Iowa State University's World Affairs Institute on Latin America. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.